So this uh, talk today, I'm going to focus on the non-traumatic causes of the acute abdomen. And specifically, I'm going to be focusing on GI causes. The uh, acute gynecologic conditions, biliary disease, specifically acute cholecystitis, and renal causes will be discussed in later lectures in your ultrasound and your GU sections. So you're all familiar with many of these cases. This is sort of the bread and butter of radiology. I won't be insulted if you open your papers and you start reading during this talk, but I think it's important for us to review these, these uh, major diagnoses and be aware that if we miss them, there's obviously a high morbidity and mortality. So I think it is worth going through. Uh, let's start with five unknown cases. This is unknown case one, unknown case two, unknown case three, unknown case four, and unknown case five. Not very subtle findings, I'm well aware of that. Okay, so the objectives will be to review the important common and the classic ant mini causes of the acute abdomen. I'll be focusing mostly on CT imaging, and then we'll review some of the information that could come up in a discussion about these entities. So just to remind you that here in North America, clearly the vast uh, majority of acute abdomen cases are evaluated with CT. We don't worry about radiation in the setting of an acute abdomen, obviously, because there's life-threatening uh, potential, and so therefore it, uh, the, the bang is, is worth the buck here. So uh, we uh, use ultrasound still for gallbladder and biliary disease, and obviously in cases of OB and gynecologic indications. Appendicitis is very good in the setting of pediatric patients as well as thin patients. Now, abdominal x-ray is really very limited in the acute abdomen uh, setting, as Fergus talked about earlier. Basically, it can help us look for gross obstruction, and theoretically, it can pick up two cc's of free air. But really, CT is the gold standard for evaluating the abdomen in the acute setting. And MRI, there's really no established role at this point, although we frequently do image pregnant patients with uh, MRI in the acute setting, and occasionally we use MRI in uh, problem solving. So let's go, this is gonna be primarily a case-based lecture. So this is case one, and we see this is a 45-year-old man with acute abdominal pain and fever. Pretty easy case here. We see a uh, large amount of stranding within the right lower quadrant. Second image, we see a high-density structure within the lumen of the appendix. This is consistent with an appendicolith. This is not oral contrast, as we see in the adjacent small bowel. And we note that there's stratification of the wall of the appendix with stranding. This is a slam dunk. We do want to mention that there's no significant free fluid in the pelvis, and there's no evidence of abscess, so this is likely uncomplicated appendicitis. You're probably all familiar with the CT signs of acute appendicitis. Just to note that the first two that are highlighted in red are by far the most sensitive and specific findings. You want to call appendicitis if you see both fat stranding in the periappendiceal region and you have an appendix with a diameter that's larger than six millimeters. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. You may also see cecal thickening, and particularly it's the medial wall of the cecum that usually gets thickened in the setting of acute appendicitis. You may or may not see an appendicolith, paracolic gut or fluid, and in this case, we see fluid as well as fascial thickening along the lateral conal fascia. Sometimes you do see some dilated loops of small bowel related to a focal ileus, so that's called the sentinel bowel loop sign, and you may have reactive lymph nodes. Now, what's the major pitfall with appendicitis? I want to stress that using the diameter as the sole criteria for diagnosing appendicitis can be very problematic. And that's because if you look here in the literature, it's been noted that about 40% of, or up to 40% of normal empty appendices without feces, without air in the lumen, can be bigger than six millimeters. So how do we handle this? Well, if you have an enlarged appendix and you don't have periappendiceal stranding, and it's greater than nine millimeters, so 10 millimeters and above, you have about a 50% chance of having appendicitis. So that's pretty good. So we wanna be, have a high clinical suspicion. Now, if the appendix is less than six millimeters and there's no periappendiceal stranding, there's a 0% chance of having appendicitis. So I think where that six millimeter number is, is good is in looking and using it as the lower threshold for appendicitis. Now, if you see the same appendix, but the, it's airless and it has low attenuation fluid within the lumen, you should probably raise the suspicion for, for uh, appendicitis.
Now remember that um, uh, CTs where there is no appendix uh, identified, this has a very high negative predictive value for excluding appendicitis. It's been reported in the literature that about 2% of those patients will go on to have appies. And uh, it's usually in the setting of thin patients um, where, you know, where you just don't see any intraperitoneal fat. And sometimes you just don't know. Cases are indeterminate and you just can't say. And uh, in those cases, it may be worth to recommend a 24-hour follow-up to reevaluate for findings. You may see uh, this come through. Obviously, this is in an MRI in a pregnant patient. We see the gravid uterus with the anterior placenta. And note that there's obvious right uh, lower quadrant fluid and a dilated abnormal appearing appendix. This is acute appendicitis on MRI. Now, what about this case? You may see atypical presentations of appendicitis, as in this case, where you see stranding in the pelvis, and you look at the area where the, where the stranding is, and you see the close relationship to the ileocecal valve. But note that the cecum is malrotated. It's lying in the pelvis. This is a patient with acute appendicitis and malrotation. So just be aware that you can have atypical presentations, pain in the left upper quadrant, pain in the pelvis, depending upon how the cecum is, is, uh, is rotated. And so you should look for the cecum and the ileocecal valve in all cases of appendicitis. Final case of appendicitis, just to show you again here, we have a abnormal appearing appendix. It's thickened, there's periappendiceal stranding, but note the marked cecal thickening. So in this case, this is just appendicitis with cecal thickening. Don't shy away from appendicitis if you have that much uh, cecal thickening, but I probably would throw in several things in the differential, including cecal diverticulitis, Crohn's disease, and maybe a rare underlying malignancy. For ultrasound, we want to look for that non-compressible, seen in this case, the appendix does not compress, a blind ending appendix, which is greater than six millimeters. Now note the specificity is very good for ultrasound, but really the sensitivities are widely variable. And so just because we have a negative ultrasound, it does not mean we can exclude uh, appendicitis. Again, here's how we measure the appendix from the outer wall to the outer wall. Occasionally, we can see echogenic foci within the lumen, which represent apodicoliths. There may be increased vascularity around the appendix. And be aware that, as you know, that uh, in the uh, patients that are obese, uh, ultrasound can be very limited. And particularly if you have a retrocecal appendix where gas can shadow the area, you probably uh, will get false, uh, false negatives. This case is to just show a more complicated case of, appendici of, a, of appendicitis. And as you know, that as, the, uh, as, the, uh, as it becomes more ugly in the pelvis with collections and so forth, it may be hard to find the appendix. And uh, just to note on this case that oftentimes when there are large collections in the pelvis, these patients do not go to surgery, but rather they get drained by interventional. The CT signs of complicated or perforated appendix are all uh, probably familiar to you as well. They're rather intuitive. Here we see a uh, appendix where there's discontinuity of the wall in a case of frank perforation. And here we have a, a rim enhancing collection in the pelvis consistent with an abscess. So in isolation, these signs aren't all that sensitive. However, when you see multiple ones, you can be uh, quite comfortable. Okay, so let's move on. This is second case. Here we have a 74-year-old male with left lower quadrant pain and fever. Again, pretty straightforward diagnosis where there's thickening of the cecum. We see multiple diverticulae here. There's peri, uh, pericolonic stranding. And you note within the wall of the colon, we see a low attenuation structure, which is suspicious for an intramural abscess. This is a case of diverticulitis. Now, the colonic wall thickening in diverticulitis can be very marked, up to 10 millimeters. And again, the first two signs here are the most sensitive and specific for acute diverticulitis. You commonly see an inflamed diverticula, but you don't have to. So I would not exclude diverticulitis without the presence uh, just because you don't see a uh, divertic uh, diverticula. You want to look for pericolonic or distant abscesses and look for the presence of extra luminal air and fluid in the setting of macro perforation. Occasionally, you may have fistulae or obstruction. Now, just to note, here are several cases of more complicated diverticula. You want to look for potential fistulae. Here we have a obvious colovesical fistulae with a thickened sigmoid and multiple diverticula. And here we have a tract extending to the skin. This was an enterocutaneous fistula resulting from the diverticulitis.
Now, what you want to do when you, when you have a case of uh, diverticulitis, you do want to mention that CT is not useful in differentiating cancer from diverticulitis. These patients will need follow-up contrast enemas or endoscopy, and these recommendations are actually supported by the surgical societies as well. Uh, you probably realize that we want to avoid doing any uh, invasive procedures or any endoscopy in the setting of the acute presentation. Rather, we wait until the symptoms have resolved because of the risk of perforation. Here is an example. This is a case of a microperforated colon cancer. Note how similar it looks to diverticulitis, thick in wall, periclonic stranding, really can't tell the difference. And one more case, one of these cases is diverticulitis. The other case is microperforation. I honestly don't even remember which one's which at this point, but we can see that there's a very similar appearance. So you really can't exclude a microperforated underlying colon cancer. It's rare, but it does occur. Okay, case three. 50-year-old with acute epigastric pain and tenderness. Again, this was one of your uh, unknown cases. Very striking findings here. The pancreas is m markedly enlarged. There's heterogeneity of the pancreas with with um, heterogeneity of the pancreas, with um, infiltration into the peripancreatic tissues, consistent with acute pancreatitis. Note how thickened and inflamed this pancreas is and how much peripancreatic fluid you can get. You should probably be aware of the most common causes of acute pancreatitis. By far, it's idiopathic or gallstones is the underlying cause with alcohol, hyperlipidemia, autoimmune pancreatitis, post-ERCP, less commonly. Now, the preferred terminology for cases such as this, where the uh, pancreas is enhancing, although there's quite a bit of peripancreatic fluid, is acute edematous pancreatitis. This is the vast majority of pancreatitis cases that you'll see, and there is a mortality of about 1 to 2 percent, so it's not, it's not negligent. Now, these patients can have normal CTs. Just because you don't see anything doesn't mean they don't have pancreatitis. If you do see abnormalities, you typically see a focal or diffusely enlarged pancreas and peripancreatic fluid. Ultrasound, as you know, is not very good in the setting of evaluating for pancreatitis. There's a lot of gas that obscures the area, although most patients will have an ultrasound after their bout of pancreatitis, and this is to look for the presence of gallstones. Here's a case of a complicated pancreatitis, and the preferred terminology here is acute necrotizing pancreatitis. Now, the difference between using the term acute fluid collection from pseudocyst is based on the presence of a well-defined capsule or wall. In addition, they usually present four weeks after the clinical presentation of uh, pancreatitis. So that's in distinction to the acute fluid collections, which you see immediately at the time of pancreatitis. You want to look for vascular complications, pseudoaneurysms, thrombosis, and then just be aware that you may see findings of chronic pancreatitis in the pancreas. Look for calcifications. Look for irregular ductal dilatation. Here's a case of a complication of pancreatitis. We see a dilated vascular structure. This is an aneurysm of the gastroduodenal artery, which you will occasionally see, and you could see the pancreas has areas of necrosis in it. I do want to clarify the term severe acute pancreatitis. These patients are a, a smaller subset of what you'll see with pancreatitis, and note their mortality is much higher. So for you to use the term severe acute pancreatitis, you're labeling that patient with a very high chance of having significant morbidity and mortality. They often have organ failure. And again, what you see is necrosis, but in order to call it severe, we want to see an area of non-enhancement that's greater than three centimeters or involving greater than 30 percent of the area of the pancreas. They often obviously have associated pseudocysts and abscesses as well. You should probably just be aware, you don't need to know the actual criteria, but you might want to be aware of several clinical criteria that are used in grading the severity of acute pancreatitis. Finally, just to mention a few clinical pearls, remember that lipase and amylase are somewhat nonspecific. Lipase is more specific than amylase, which can be elevated in many other conditions, uh, but these levels can be normal, so uh, not always helpful to rely on the lab values. And again, you want to look for the extent of extra pancreatic inflammation, which can extend from the thorax all the way into the abdomen. I would probably avoid the term phlegmon. There's been some controversy about this. Phlegmon's a confusing term. I would use the term extrapancreatic inflammation when talking about areas of inflammation that don't have focal uh, liquefaction within them.
Management is usually conservative if there's no signs of infection. And the key for us is we want to try to differentiate the presence of abscesses that are infected or pseudocysts that are super infected from areas of pancreatic necrosis that are infected because the mortality is significantly higher in the setting of pancreatic necrosis that becomes infected. And in particular, these areas often do not do very well with uh, percutaneous drainage, unlike the pseudocysts and the infected abscesses, which may be treated more aggressively. All right, case four. This is an ant mini. We see the area of abnormality within the left lower quadrant here. We see a fatty mass with surrounding uh, hyper-dense uh, hyper, uh, enhancement, pericolonic inflammation. The location of this finding is pretty classic. This is an ant mini for epiploic appendagitis. Now, if you know, this is a case of normal epiploic appendages, which are these fatty fingers that arise off the uh, intraperitoneal portions of the colon. We see here, in this case, ascites really nicely outlines the presence of these uh, appendages. And it's thought that this is, uh, that the appendagitis is related to a twisting or a torsion, which lends, then leads to infarct of the, uh, up the, appendi of the uh, appendage. And uh, there's really no known cause. It's thought that perhaps exercise may contribute to uh, this entity. Patients may have symptoms suggestive of a more uh, indolent infection, and it can really mimic appendicitis and diverticulitis clinically, although these patients, no follow-up is needed and treatment is conservative. Again, here's another classic case of epiploic appendagitis. You may see this central dot or high-density nodule within the area of epiploic appendagitis consistent with the tor stalk. And then you may, ha you may see this thickened uh, hyper-enhancing region, which is actually the thickened parietal peritoneum that's walling off this inflammation. And here we see uh, pericolonic inflammation as well. You usually don't get colonic wall thickening. Now, as far as the differential diagnosis, you know, omental infarct is in there. Typically, the omental infarcts aren't as well defined, but really, you don't need to differentiate between these two entities, given that they're both treated conservative and they both need no follow-up. Um, here's uh, an example of a uh, omental infarct, and here we have a, a acute case. This is actually a uh, hernia plug that was uh, that was uh, done at the time of left inguinal hernia repair. Again, several more cases, we're seeing the same thing with the hyperdense rim, fatty focus, pericolonic stranding, and a central dot sign. I'm just showing you here that uh, epiploic appendagitis, when it heals, it can scar down, it can become calcified, and you're just left with this little nub of soft tissue within the region of the uh, prior inflammation. Okay, case five, shifting gears a little bit here. This was a 61-year-old with acute abdominal pain and vomiting, and I'm showing this to really drive home the point that abdominal x-rays are quite futile in the setting of acute uh, obstruction. Note we see really a gasless abdomen in he here, no evidence of free air. The next step, of course, is to get a CT. So the patient gets a CT, and we see multiple dilated loops of small bowel. Some of these loops are contrast-filled, excuse me, Others are not contrast-filled, but we can see that at least the wall is still enhancing nicely. Come further down, and note the sharp transition here between the dilated segment and the non-dilated segment. We want to evaluate this area and look for the presence of masses, hernia, or intussusception that may be causing the uh, area of obstruction. If we don't see any of those things, it's most likely a case of adhesive small bowel obstruction. Again, with adhesive obstruction, you may see acute angulation of the bowel. Oftentimes, you can see stretching or kinking of the actual bowel loops. You may have areas of bowel wall thickening as well. So just the overall message about imaging of bowel obstruction, don't obsess about the transition point. Really, what you want to see is dilated loops approximately and collapsed loop distally. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot made of these measurements that if the bowel loop is more than three centimeters, it's abnormal, or in order to call obstruction, you have to have bowel, proximal loops greater than 2.5 and collapse loops less than one centimeter. It's really more of an overall gestalt. Um, you may see areas of a small bowel feces sign at the site of the transition point. And again, CT is really helpful over x-rays in looking for the cause of the underlying obstruction. If you don't see a cause, it's most likely adhesive disease, and I would say so, that this is most likely adhesive disease, adhesive disease responsible for about 70% of all small bowel obstructions. You should probably be, uh, be uh, somewhat familiar with the common causes of obstruction I've listed here, the major cause of large bowel obstruction being colorectal carcinoma in the vast majority of cases.
Okay, moving on to case six here, we see uh, dilated loops of bowel proximally, right, and, di and uh, decompressed or collapsed loop distally. We look in the site of the transition and we see that there is an intussuscepting mass at the site of the small bowel obstruction. Note that there's some high density material within the intussusception and we see incidentally an aggressive bone lesion within the pelvis. It's a young patient. This is a guy who had a small bowel obstruction secondary to an intussuscepting metastasis, which was a osteosarcoma as the lead point. He actually had multiple areas of intussusception and then an aggressive bone med. So just a word about small bowel obstructions. By far, the most uh, pediatric, uh, pediatrics uh, have the most intussusceptions, with adults only making up about 5% of cases. And, and usually, with adults, uh, the majority will have an underlying lead cause, unlike for pediatric patients, where it's often idiopathic or due to uh, lymphoid hyperplasia. And unlike pediatric patients, if for adults, resection is really the treatment of choice, particularly if there's an underlying lead point. But be aware that intussusception can be an incidental CT finding. You've probably all encountered at least one case of this where you see an intussusception, five minutes later, the intussusception resolved. So these are usually, particularly in the absence of any bowel obstruction, these are typically transient, they're self-limited, and they're really inconsequential. And in comparison, as I mentioned, pediatric intussusception, much more common and usually uh, treated with pneumatic reduction due to the uh, lack of a, an underlying cause. Again, just to remind you, tips for CT, don't spend a whole lot of time looking for that transition point. Just look in the area where the general area where their transition is, looking for masses, hernias, as, and intussusceptions. And you really want to assess for the presence of perforation or strangulation, right? So what are the signs of strangulation? Well, here we have a case of a man who had pain, vomiting, and a prior surgical history, so high suspicion for adhesive disease, and we see dilated loops of small bowel here, some of which do not fill with contrast, and note here that we start to see loss of the enhancing bowel wall. This is called the disappearing bowel wall sign. You may also see excess free fluid within the area of the transition. Again, this was a patient who had dead gut at the time of surgery from a strangulated small bowel obstruction. Note again that the bowel loop does not show terrific enhancement relative to the adjacent bowel loops, and we see infiltration into the adjacent mesentery. So again, I've listed those uh, signs for strangulation. Always look for excessive free fluid, in this case a lot of fluid around the liver mesenteric infl infiltration, and disappearing bowel wall signs. Bowel wall thickening and pneumatosis you may see, although these are a little bit more unreliable. Pneumatosis can be seen in many benign causes, as you are probably well aware of. Final case of small bowel obstruction. Here we have a U-shaped loop, right? A uh, very uh, dilated loop that's rather clustered in appearance, mesenteric infil infiltration. Again, U-shaped here, C-shaped here. This has been described as clustering balloons on a sign, on a, excuse me, clustering balloons on a string sign, and this is a case of a closed loop obstruction. You should definitely be familiar with these cases. As you know, they are surgical emergencies. These are cases that you want to pick up the phone, call the ER, or call your surgeon. Um, and it's when we see basically here, as in this case, the bowel is, the segment of bowel is occluded at two points, with the two points being in a single location or a very close location. Causes can be underlying adhesions, hernia, or small bowel volvulus. And because of the shape of this closed loop, it's predisposed to twist and volvulize, and therefore it's at higher risk of having strangulation. Again, signs that you might want to say are beak whirl signs, clustering balloons on a string, and again, high rate of strangulation. Quick word about small bowel obstruction secondary to hernia. The external hernias are the most common cause of small bowel obstructions, with internal hernias making up a smaller percentage, although you should be familiar with the appearance of a paraduodenal hernia and other rare hernias, such as the epiploic foramen. In this case, we see the obvious dilatation and involvement of the uh, right inguinal canal here. You want to tr try to avoid using the term incarceration on your reports because this is a clinical diagnosis based on whether or not the, patient, the physician can reduce the hernia sac. All right, case eight here. 68-year-old man with acute abdominal pain, vomiting, and anemia. And what do we note? We note that the colon has an unusual appearance. There's some proximal distension and an abrupt transition here where the bowel wall is thickened, the lumen is narrowed. 
This is a case of obstructing colon cancer. Here we see the dilated bowel loop and the uh, cancer. This is the CT equivalent of the apple core lesion that you'll see on barium enema. Be aware that large bowel obstruction is significantly less common than small bowel obstructions, and the vast majorities are due to colon cancer. Typically, patients have present more gradual in onset, although the rectosigmoid cancers can present uh, acutely from obstruction because the uh, rectosigmoid region is more narrow, and also the stool is harder in that area, so it can, be, uh, it can uh, pr uh, occasionally present acutely. And then diverticular disease and volvulus are other main causes, and volvulus was discussed previously. What about this case, case nine? This is a patient with acute upper, with acute upper abdominal pain and vomiting. And here we see a kind of strange looking air and fluid collection embedded within the wall of the gastric antrum and proximal duodenum. On the coronal view, we can see that there's this strange outpouching of, of air and fluid. This is on CT, this is gastric ulcer disease. And when gastric ulcers perf, you can often have a large amount of gas. Pe peptic ulcer disease can be difficult to recognize on CT, and you may just see some areas of subtle gastric wall thickening. You want to look for free air, either in the wall or adjacent to the ulcer. Occasionally, these patients may have a gastric outlet obstruction at presentation. And you should all be familiar with the causes, other major causes of gastrointestinal perforation, including post-op leaks, uh, ulcerating tumor, Crohn's disease, and of course, ingestion of foreign bodies. When you have a case of gastric ulcer, you want to look for hemorrhage, perforation, and development of obstruction or fistula as the major complications. Here we have a case uh, of a malignant gastric ulcer. We can see the penetrating ulcer within the gastric wall. And note how thickened this gastric wall is as we come inferiorly, just really marked enlargement. This was a patient who had underlying adenocarcinoma and a gastric ulcer. Case 10. This one's a more obvious case, known abdominal aortic aneurysm and increasing abdominal pain. We see the large abdominal aorta. We want to comment on there appears to be some lack of calcium in this region here along the anterior wall. And here we really have all of this extensive high density fluid in the retroperitoneum extending into the posterior pararenal space, space and into the perirenal space. This patient then went on to get contrast and note that you don't see any active extravasation. This is very common. Most of the patients that have active extravasation never make it to the hospital and never make it to the scanner. So you're more likely to see just high density fluid, but you obviously want to have a very uh, clear cut message here that this is consistent with a ruptured AAA. And aside from the retroperitoneal blood, you want to look for focal disruption of calcium in the wall. Occasionally, as in this case, you may see that ext active extravasation, but obviously a horrible prognosis. And occasionally you may miss these. There is some false negative rates due to small contain ruptures and false positives in the setting of aneurysms that have perianeurysmal inflammation. So sometimes it can be tricky if there's an inflammatory component related to the abdominal aortic aneurysm. Also, bulky lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy can sometimes resemble a, uh, a ruptured AAA. I want to point out here that the risk of rupture goes up significantly when the aneurysm has reached five centimeters. So before that, it's only about 10%, a little more than 10%, but it goes up to 25%. And at this point, the risk of rupture is greater than the morbidity associated with the surgery, and so these patients do undergo urgent surgery. Be aware, though, that many die before reaching the hospital, and even if they do reach the hospital, there's a 50% mortality. You should all be familiar with this sign. This is the CT sign of impending rupture called the crescent sign. And what we have here is this uh, crescentic high density uh, material within the aortic wall. This represents intramural hematoma, and it strongly correlates with impending rupture of the AAA, particularly in patients that have symptoms. Even if it's mild symptoms, you want to have a high, uh, a really a high suspicion for impending rupture and in the setting of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Here we have a pitfall of abdominal aortic aneurysm. We see that there is abnormal paraaortic tissue, but right, we don't see evidence of a abdominal aortic aneurysm here. Rather, what we see is just paraaortic soft tissue. We see hydronephrosis. This is a case of retroperitoneal fibrosis. Uh, lymphoma would be in the differential for this case as well.
And finally, the last case is this, uh, this one. This is an 80-year-old patient with severe abdominal pain and distension. We look at the liver and we see a odd appearing uh, collection of gas. This has been described as the crow's feet appearance. Note that the distribution of air is in the periphery of the liver, not in the center of the liver, which was what you would be expecting for, pneumo, uh, for pneumobilia. Because of the direction of the bile flow, biliary air is central, portal venous gas, as in this case, is in the periphery of the liver, particularly in the non-dependent portions. On the CT, uh, through the belly, down lower, we see dilated loops of, of bowel, we see portal, ooh, excuse me, we see uh, mesenteric air, and we see pneumatosis within the bowel wall. So this is a case of CT, of, uh, a case of acute bowel ischemia. You should all be familiar with the most common signs that you may see in acute bowel ischemia. About 50% of the time, you will see an actual thrombus within an arterial uh, structure, either a major branch, such as the SMA or the celiac, or uh, less commonly within a uh, more distal branch. You may have bowel wall thickening, and you want to look for the presence of venous air, lack of bowel enhancement, and occasionally you may see infarctions in other organs in the abdomen. Remember, clinically, these mesenteric ischemia cases are patients that present with pain disproportional, disproportionate to the physical exam. There may be evidence of uh, ischemia, such as lactic acidosis on uh, labs. And you do want to ask whether there is an underlying history of mitral valve disease if the patient is predisposed to atrial fibrillation. And mortality is very high, and therefore uh, it's very important that we recognize these cases early on. In the, uh, for intestinal ischemia and small bowel ischemia, it's usually an arterial thrombus or an embolic source uh, that's causing the ischemia. Here's another final example of a few cases of bowel ischemia. This case, we see a uh, low-density filling defect within the superior mesenteric vein, and here we see additional infarcts in other organs as well. Now, the last point I want to make about ischemia is that colonic ischemia is actually different from small bowel ischemia in that it's rarely secondary to vasoocclusive disease and more typically associated with vasoconstriction from low flow states and hypotension. The distal left colon, as in this case, is most typically involved. It's the IMA distribution. But be aware that this is really a nonspecific appearance in the colon, and you have to do an endoscopy to confirm that it is, in fact, colonic ischemia. Here's another case of colonic ischemia. This patient actually did have pneumatosis here seen in the wall, as well as mesenteric air. So to summarize, the take-home points is that CT is the backbone for the acute abdomen. I've tried to show you that the stakes are high for these acute abdominal cases. You want to focus on the most common diseases and either exclude or make the diagnosis in the cases of these, uh, in the critical cases. And really, you don't want to miss in practice, uh, ruptured aneurysms, mesenteric ischemia, and closed loop obstructions. So let's just quickly go over the unknown cases. Several of these you saw, they were embedded in the talk, but the first case, obvious acute appendicitis here, uncomplicated without perforation. This one was tricky. There were just a few foci of gas that was seen in the sigmoid mesocolon region, but this is a classic location, and most commonly this is going to be perforated diverticulitis. How about this case? This was a classic case of epiploic appendagitis with this fatty and soft tissue mass in a good location adjacent to the left colon. And this case we saw during the talk, this is a case of uh, quite advanced acute pancreatitis. And final case, large abdominal aortic aneurysm with a large amount of retroperitoneal high-density fluid. This is classic ruptured AAA.